Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening. Uh, my name is Neil Ward. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs here at uh, UEA. I'm thrilled to see so many people, uh, colleagues and students here, um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome so many visitors to UEA as well. Uh, our speaker for this evening is Professor George Mackay from the School of Art, Media and American Studies. Uh, George became Professor of Media Studies at UEA in 2014, uh, and in addition to this role, George has been an Arts and Humanities Research Council Leadership Fellow for the AHRC's Connected Communities Programme since 2012. This involves work with the AHRC and a large number of award holders and community organisations and partners uh, on the programme. Additionally, George undertakes his own research around community cultures, disability arts, festivals uh, and music, which includes the organising and delivery of, of events with partners. Uh, his position as Leadership Fellow was renewed for a further three-year period uh, in September 2015. Uh, George's research interests are broadly around questions of practices of cultural politics, and more specifically in the areas of alternative cultures, media and lifestyles, popular music from punk to jazz, festivals, collaborative research, community music and participatory arts, and disability in music, and gardening. He's written and edited many books. Um, his first book was published 20 years ago, 1996, and it's called Senseless Acts of Beauty, Cultures of Resistance Since the 60s. Um, it's an admirable book and was produced in the aftermath of the 1994 Criminal Justice and Public Order Act, when rave culture, New Age travellers and the anti-Rhodes movement all came together in a wonderful melange of moral panic. Uh, it's got lovely chapters on Crass, the anarcho-punk band, one of the most interesting things ever to come out of Epping, uh, in my opinion. Probably second most interesting thing. Um, I can speak about this particular book knowledgeably and with some affection because I bought it in 1996 when it hey. came out. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> um, I remember thinking, oh, that looks interesting. I was teaching and researching in environmental politics um, at the time, and my students at Newcastle University were very interested in direct action and activism, and I was writing about surfers against sewage uh, who were protesting about bathing water pollution and used to campaign with a 10-foot inflatable turd. Um, so uh, the book had something to say to me about uh, a new culture of uh, resistance and direct action, and that's how I personally became involved uh, with George's work. Um, it's a measure of the esteem and affection that I attach to this particular book that I have moved offices eight times since 1996, and each time I have a jolly good clear out of my books, but I still have senseless acts of beauty on my shelf. So I wanted to take the opportunity to do a random act of kindness by complimenting George on his senseless acts of beauty. Um, Times have moved on, and so has George, and among, amongst his other books are DIY Culture, Party and Protest in 90s Britain, uh, which was published by Verso, uh, Glastonbury, A Very English Fair, uh, published in 2000, uh, Community Music, A Handbook, Circular Breathing, The Cultural Politics of Jazz in Britain, published in 2005, uh, Radical Gardening, Politics, Idealism and Rebellion in the Garden, in 2011, and Shaking All Over, Popular Music and Disability, published by Michigan University Press in 2013. And I think his most recent book is The Pop Festival, History, Media, Music and Culture. Uh, his website is georgemckay.org, and there are many more writings and videos that can be uh, accessed uh, there. During his academic career, he's been the recipient of around 30 grants and awards, and these currently include two projects with festivals collaborating with the EFG London Jazz Festival on the Arts and Humanities Research Council's Impact of Festivals project uh, as, part of an, an, um, as part of an international consortium with academics and festival organisers on the EU Heritage Plus programme. Uh, the project, I think, is called Cultural Heritage and Improvised Music in European Festivals. And as with all European projects, you need uh, uh, an acronym, and the acronym is rather appropriately CHIME, Cultural Heritage and Improvised Music in European Festivals. Uh, at UEA, we're extremely proud of the work that our colleagues 
uh, our undertaking in finding solutions to the big global challenges of our day, but also deepening our understanding of the society uh, in which we find ourselves, and at the same time, making their own important and creative contributions to contemporary culture. George is taking a leading role in ensuring that the study undertaken at universities like UEA is genuinely connected to people's experiences and concerns. And you don't have to spend very long perusing uh, his website to see that he's a real public intellectual in his work. So please join me in welcoming Professor George Mackay to give his inaugural lecture this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for those very kind words and that very kind tribute about a 20-year-old book. I feel both young and old at the same time. Um, I came back to Norwich about a year and a bit ago to work at the UEA, and uh, I must say I'm delighted to be working in this institution. It's a fabulous place to be, and uh, I'm very grateful for the honour of having an inaugural. Actually, I've been a professor for 17 years, and in neither of the other two universities I worked in did they manage to give me an inaugural. I don't know why. But UEA has been bold, brave, or foolhardy enough to do it. So here we go. I'm Charlie. You know. I'm Norman. Pleased to meet you. I'm Nicky. Hello. Welcome. How are you doing, Harry? My name is David. And I'm here. And? Guess what? I, I want to be straight. Uh, yeah, and I'm George, and uh, I wonder if I want to be straight too. But what does that mean? Punk era singer, songwriter, band leader, and disabled pop star Ian Dury's 1980s song, I Want to Be Straight, is usually understood as his own response to, even rewriting of, the early hit Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll, which was generally seen as an anthemic celebration of the hedonistic pop, pop and rock lifestyle. But I Want to Be Straight is more complex, possibly moving outside a heterosexual frame, straight as in not bent or queer, as well as straight in the obvious meaning of not hedonistically narcotized. I want to be straight. I'm sick and tired of taking drugs and staying up late, he sings after all. But from its very title, as well as its delivery pop corny intro introduction in which the band members introduce themselves to the listener in turn by first name, the song offers us a pian to orthodoxy perhaps, but more interestingly, a pian to orthotics. When the notoriously or legendarily unstable saxophonist Davy Payne announces, My name is David, he does so in his best, worst disabled voice, for instance. Mal Canto, I call it. Sounding like he has cerebral palsy. And Dury himself, alongside other 60s and 70s British pop stars like Donovan and Steve Harley, or the Canadians Joni Mitchell and Neil Young, was a polio survivor. As a result of the historical development of orthopedics and orthotic technologies, quote, on Jacques Dicker, straightening out physically and straightening out behaviorally are put in the same semantic field, a normative one. Concluding the spoken introduction, band leader Jury says, and I'm Ian, and guess what? Oi, I want to be straight with the word straight landing on the first beat of the propulsive rhythm of the bulk of the song. It's his guess what interjection here that interests me. Easily, of course, it refers the listener back to sex and drugs of three years earlier and shows the change in the jury persona that will surprise them. But also, should we be so very surprised at this disabled man who wants to be straight, who wants to confirm, who wants to conform? In Polio and its Aftermath, Mark Schell writes, Polio is asymmetric freezing of various muscles made for deformity so visually disturbing that the science or art of orthopaedics owes its development to making the crooked straight in the age of the polio epidemics up to the 1950s in the West. Tens of thousands of untreated polio, continues Schell, were called deformed, misshapen, hunchbacked. 
Polios who could not afford surgeries often earned their living in the freak shacks. One of the UK's founding professors of disability studies, Colin Barnes, has reminded us that an element in the development of disability culture and the arts that should not be overlooked is the relationship between disabled people and the entertainment industry. Historically, he says, people with perceived impairments or abnormalities have provided an important source of entertainment for the non-disabled majority. Such entertainment ranges from 19th century freak shows to 21st century performance art. I have mentioned freak shows a couple of times, so let's go back a little to rock and roll. My hands are shaky and my knees are weak. I can't seem to stand on my own two feet. Who do you thank when you have such luck? Elvis Presley. I'm in love. I'm all shook up. 1956. The uncontrollability of the pop body has been a persistent feature since its earliest days. From All Shook Up in the USA and Johnny Kidd and the Pirates Shaken All Over 1960 in Britain. Songs about uncontrollable neurological tremors as physical symptoms conflating the ecstasy of sexual attraction and of dance are heard from rock and roll on. The opening argument is that popular music has always been about corporeal transformation or excess and the display of those. There has always been a whole lot of shaking going on. Some pop disabilities are among those which, like the freak shows of 19th century America, could offer what Rosemary Garland Thompson calls a counter-narrative of peculiarity as eminence, peculiarity as eminence, in which infreakment could mean authenticity, authority, even status. So from rock and roll, in, uh, for instance, we might consider Gene Vincent. Watch his little dance with the mic stand. Vincent's performances of disability in black leathers and flaunted limp from at least two road traffic accidents, one on his motorbike, was central to his British and, uh, and European stage and TV acts. He had a permanent and visible link, uh, limp sorry, and uh, needed to wear a steel brace to protect the seriously damaged left leg. Following a backstage tour in 1960, a backstage collapse in 1960 during a UK tour, Vincent would be reported in the music press flying back to the United States, quote, mentally and physically broken. To his biker and rock and roll audiences, Gene Vincent was the real deal. His permanent and unmaskable physical damage, the fact that it was a result of a motorbike accident, his black leathers and incendiary performances, sometimes from moving curiously, awkwardly around the stage, sometimes by stillness as his band moved around his stationary central presence, all confirming an authentic crip self. But that authentic crip self had to be performed for live audiences night after night and captured for media broadcast. So here in a British TV show bringing London's bikers and their motorbikes into the studio, the camera at one stage does a full-length body shot moving from calipered foot up to singing head. The 
British producer Jack Good famously instructed Vincent to exaggerate his disability for the camera with the words, limp, you bugger, limp. <laughs> to be physically disabled on stage was now insufficient. The defect had to be ostentatiously performed before the camera to ensure that viewers at home would catch it. One of the youngsters in London audiences of concerts by American Crip stars like Vincent and earlier deaf star Johnny Ray was schoolboy then art student Ian Dury, tentatively undertaking some preliminary research about music, performance, disability, storing up sounds and shows in his mind. This research originates from a special issue of the journal Popular Music I edited in 2009 on disability and pop. This fed into my subsequent book, Shaken All Over, Popular Music and Disability, and I've recently returned to explore further some aspects of these questions in a chapter in the wonderfully exciting new book, The Oxford Handbook of Music and Disability Studies, called, my chapter's called Punk Rock and Disability. The, my book turned up last week, but it's got 42 chapters, and I didn't dare read the other 41 in case they invalidated or undercut my entire argument for tonight. <laughs> but if they do, I'll tell you. And uh, Neil very kindly mentioned uh, some of my, uh, my other works, but I wanted to just put it in the context. Um, you know, this specific work on cultural disability studies draws on two decades of writing about what can broadly be termed cultural politics or cultural studies with a soundtrack, as my website, Strapline, puts it. And here are some of those books. Okay. I want to talk about three aspects of disability in pop. The polio stroke pop generation the place of the wheelchair in popular music, and then a bit of late period punk rock. According to Canadian singer-songwriter and polio survivor Joni Mitchell, polio is the disease that eats muscles. If it eats the muscle of your heart, it kills you. If it eats the muscles that control the flexing of your lungs, you end up in an iron lung. If it eats the muscle of your leg, it withers, or of your arm, it withers. In my case, it ate muscles in my back. The same thing happened with Neil Young. I had to learn to stand again and then to walk. So, quite extraordinarily, in Canada in 1951, both Joni Mitchell, aged nine, and Neil Young, aged five, contracted the poliomyelitis virus, infantile paralysis. In Young's case, as his father wrote at the time, over the night, overnight the child moved like a mechanical man, jerkily holding his head in a tense position. Home after a short period of hospital isolation, the boy told his father, polio is the worst cold there is. In um, Christopher J. Rutty's view, the 1970 Young song, Helpless, contains his childhood memories of the experience of the disease. The song focuses on the moment, the location, and the aftermath, both immediate and long-term, of the boy's contraction of the virus. Um, and I particularly like this short extract because it shows both Neil Young and Joni Mitchell on backing vocals. So we have here the two Canadian polios singing his polio song together. The title is also a kind of single word chorus and is repeated in groups of four by backing singers. Here, Joni performing behind the curtain for contractual reasons or because they didn't want to spoil the thunder of her coming on later in the show or something weird. 
and um, including the fade out at the song's end. Such a repeated state of helplessness captures the family moment, which is one of disease, uncertainty, dread, as well as perhaps some social shame, since, as the lyric says, the chains are locked and tied across the door. Standard medical procedure at the time involved quarantine. Um, Young's father remembered, I was the only one allowed out and only to buy groceries. The white quarantine sign greeted me every time I returned to the house. The words on the sign, poliomyelitis, infantile paralysis. Let's just think about Young for a moment further. The grizzled, grungy singer-songwriter, 60s survivor, band member of Buffalo, Springfield and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, a stubbornly independent-minded star who can rock out for 20-minute blues distorted guitar solos and then come back um, in with that pure characteristic falsetto, that weird voice as he's described it. Polio as a boy, epileptic in his 20s, having seizures on stage during Mr. Soul with Buffalo Springfield. Ian Curtis would later do that trick of disaster in a decade's time with Joy Division in Manchester. Music from nowadays Clancy, Clancy Can't Even Sing to Helpless to the, near, to the near career breaking trans electronic period in the 1980s. One of his managers advising him to keep all that polio epilepsy stuff quiet. Two children born with cerebral palsy. His lyrics quoted back to him in the rock star's suicide note and in later life, the advocate and fundraiser for disability education and assistive technology via the Bridge School annual concerts. Young's is a musical career, a life informed by the everyday personal and familial experiences of multiple disability, which is then explored in the music. Um, so with his wife, Peggy, they helped establish the Bridge School in the, on the West Coast in the States for children with um, intellectual impairments. And um, every year, Young puts on a series of concerts called the Bridge School Concerts. And what I like about this one, okay, so he starts, he does a little intro. This is one of the concerts from about three years ago. There's a short intro of the chords. Everyone knows what's coming because it's Heart of Gold and everyone recognises it, the crowd cheers. And Young moves up to the mic facing the audience as though he's going to sing the song to them. away from the mic stand. I want to live. Sings the song to the kids at the back of the stage. I've been a minor for a heart of gold. It sees expressions. He turned his back on the main audience. As for Journey Mitchell, there are important considerations concerning the weakened physical body's capacity to make music for the instrumentalists among these polio survivors, especially perhaps those from blues, jazz, and jazz-tinged musics who valorized... Uh, right, hang on, don't go wrong. Especially for those from jazz and uh, blues and jazz tinged music who valorized instrumental technique as a, result, as, a, as a route to musical individuality. She's explained her unusual guitar chord technique and hence characteristic acoustic sound as the result of her attenuated muscularity. My left hand is somewhat clumsy because of polio. I had to simplify the shapes of the left hand, but I craved chordal movement that I couldn't get out of standard tuning without an extremely articulate left hand. 
We can view, what we can view as Mitchell's cripping of guitar technique was a strategy of adaptation, and the resultant music was not heard as an expression of limitation, rather it was prized by her, her fellow musicians, and her fans as the articulation of an individual voice. Good thing I couldn't play standard because it came out original, she said. Let's stay with the polio pop theme for a few more minutes, for it is a surprisingly rich and vibrant culture. Polio dancing. This is a really weak pun, right? You know pole dancing? Well, I called it polio dancing. I sort of think it doesn't work. In Kingston, Jamaica, in the early 1960s, some of the polio boys at the residential Mona Rehabilitation Centre met and would later get together to form a band, a close vocal harmony trio in the style of the Wailers. They were called Israel Vibration. As with many polio artists, the fact of childhood institutionalization was formative for the group. We can view this as an instance of the artistic compensation of the isolate. Separation from the majority affected a stronger minority identity. The three young men had several points in common, a passion for the close harmony reggae singing popular at the time, an interest in Rastafarianism, and the experiences of polo and institutionalization. For a while, some other Rastas rejected them, seeing their impairments as a punitive sign from God. Jump up arrows, yeah. So charge an empire of theater. In a ticket to old fence vibrate. Root boy, a shuffle, let the hunt. Root boy, a shuffle, kinky reggae. Back when we jump up a little, yeah. Say, what that did that day. Slappy tandy, not to you, them officiously. You got to face your reality. But this a rude boy, a shuffling. A shuffling, you ain't getting fun when we jump on the lender. Yeah, say, I want to tell you, rude boy, a skunky. Occasionally, Israel Vibration sing songs that resonate with their experience of impairment, while even the reggae accompaniment, with its characteristic and insistent offbeat rhythm and chords, seems suddenly more fitting for musicians with mobility difficulties, where a lilt is no longer so far removed from a limp. Indeed, Israel Vibration invite us to consider reggae music per se as a music of disability, precisely because of its a la zoppa characteristics. Alazoppa is a musical term or direction for uneven rhythms in a melody, meaning limping or halting in Italian. This rhythmic figure is part of the instrumental tradition of representing physical impairments. In this context, Alazoppa invites us to reconsider reggae's characteristic offbeat rhythm guitar and keyboard, and even more so reggae's sometimes out of time echo dub practices as less lilt, more stilt. One other, polio dancing, routine. This star of musical film contracted polio as a child in the early 1930s in an epidemic in Texas. She was encouraged to take up dance by her parents as a form of physical therapy to work on her lower limbs, muscle capacity and strength. She was lucky. Her legs were affected by polio, but it was her legs that would make her famous. As an older woman, she would mention in interviews that she thought her back muscles remained partially atrophied from her childhood bout of polio. The wider point here is one of the complex relationship between disease, symptoms, disability, therapy, treatment, and creativity. Jazz musicians like saxophonist David Sanborn 
or uh, pianist Horace Parlin were polio kids encouraged to take up their instruments in childhood as an element of their physiotherapy and recovery. For each, Sanborn and Parlin, as well as for the Texan polio girl who became dancer Sid Charisse, it is arguable that the successful musical career came about because rather than in spite of the childhood disease. Musicality and performance originating as a therapeutic response to the residual symptoms of the medical condition. And to be honest, that paragraph is just there so I can show you this video. Crikey. Um, one of the YouTube comments when I was researching this, um, that's one of the nice things about this work, you can watch YouTube and call it research, was um, the best legs in the history of legs. <laughs> what is it Ian Jury sings in uh, one of his pieces called The Body Song? The leg, a source of much delight, it carries weight and governs height. I mean, I think there's a bit more going on with these legs. Just look at the effect they're having on Gene Kelly. <laughs> and even the door at the back of the club, the club door, has a kind of eye shape on it. There's a lot of gazing going on in that scene from Singing in the Rain. OK, wheelchairs. I want now to turn and look at three different man uh, mediations of the singer in a wheelchair from film and television from the 1940s to the 80s. The wheelchair is the standard um, symbol of, of, of disability. You know, you see a wheelchair and you think, oh, that's where I can't park, or that's a disabled toilet, or something like that. So um, it has a central presence, even though, in fact, most disabled people aren't wheelchair users. But nonetheless, uh, it's an interesting sort of um, position to consider and topic. They may help us to think about the normative perspective on physical disability that endlessly confirms what the late Tobin Siebers has called the ideology of ability. To do this, we can first see a direct pop statement of the ideology of ability from a 1969 hit single. This is the fact that... It's hard to love a man whose legs are bent and paralyzed. Ruby Don't Take Your Love to Town by Kenny Rogers in first, ed first edition resonated in the US at that time, 1969, because of the Vietnam War. In the song The Disabled Vet has returned from that old crazy Asian war doing his patriotic chore. Disabled, emasculated, sexually dysfunctional. Here's the line again from a 1972 performance. <laughs> It's hard to love a man whose legs are bent and paralysed. Maybe even more so a woman. 
The following three stories and scenes show a range of the music and media industry's way of dealing with physical disability in pop. Concealment, covert presentation, but distaste, and overt presentation and initial celebration. Connie Boswell was an American music, radio and film star from the 30s and 40s, both as a member of the Boswell sisters and in her duo work with Bing Crosby. She was another polio survivor, actually, and a wheelchair user. Laurie Strass has argued that Boswell occupied a unique position as the only visibly disabled A-list female popular entertainment for most of the 20th century which also indicates the extent to which we may consider popular musical disabilities as, so primarily as male phenomena. Pop and rock seemingly offer masculine prerogatives here. In many of her film scenes, viewers see Boswell sitting at a piano, sitting on a chair near a radio, another source of music, using her very active arms and hands as physical manifestation of the melody or lyric or the scenes regularly cutting to shots of moving bodies, dancers, a crowd of fans, which add visual momentum to her corporeal staticness. On stage, singing live, she could be sitting in, in an elaborate disguised wheelchair and be pulled by stagehands in the wings and manoeuvred to central stage, or she would be apparently standing ready for the audience and the song, curtains opening to reveal her already ready in position. In this extract from the 1942 film, Syncopation, she is, as the story tells us, running late and has just arrived at the club and is sitting on a stool at the bar. The character she is playing is a version of herself. She's called Connie Boswell, but sort of from the waist up. Her impairment is concealed by her being seated in situ and her not moving. When the band strikes up for her to um, begin singing, she does not move to the stand nor does anyone in the club expect her to. She sings from the bar. The band accompanies her from the stage. The audience turns its back on the band to watch and enjoy Connie's vocal performance. And the final shot we see shows the crowded distance between her and the instrumental musicians accompanying her. Who's here? Where? Am I glad to see you? I've been looking all over for you. Always caught in a traffic jam. Some crowd, huh? I'll say. Makes me feel like the third man in the telephone booth. Oh, oh. When do I start? You're on right now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, friendship is a wonderful thing, and here's the proof of it. We have with us tonight a little lady that came down here just to send the Jive Club off to a flying start, singing a brand new song as only she can sing it, Connie Boswell. <laughs> Um, image from a, um, well you can see Connie as a the cover star of Downbeat in 1938 and if you look carefully in the bottom left hand corner of the magazine image you can see under that seat there's a tiny little wheel that's not a chair, that's a wheelchair 
You know? And this is a, another instance of sort of Connie's uh, disabled presence, disabled absence, and uh, the, the, the covert nature of things at that time. These next two are instances of adventitious disability, where the musician was already a star and thus had both to manage his private, personal, life-changing impairment and to negotiate his public's reactions to and perceptions of it. The English singer and drummer Robert Wyatt's own mediated public reappearance as a star with paraplegia took place accompanied in Wyatt's case with a level of um, controversy. Following an accident in 1973 when he fell from a window while at a party resulting in a spinal cord injury, Wyatt quite quickly, surprisingly quickly really, returned to recording and performing, later discussing his intriguing shift from the back drumming to the front singing of the stage. Being in a wheelchair means you have to deliberate what you do, he explained. You can't be so impulsive. Not being a drummer anymore then, I then had decided to concentrate what had previously only been a sideline, which was singing. That was all I had left anyway, so that's what I did. Instead of just being somebody's drummer banging away in the background, when I'm my own singer, I can just stop where I want to. I think I became a better, more concentrated musician. The following year, after his accident, 1974, he made a surprise appearance on the BBC's leading weekly TV pop show at the time, Top of the Pops, singing his offbeat minor hit, a cover of Neil Diamond's I'm a Believer, the, the monkey's hit. Wyatt's appearance was initially notable for two facts. His band was drawn from members of the prog rock scene, including Pink Floyd and Henry Cow, not the normal top of the pops roster by any means. And the singer was in a wheelchair. Um, his second biographer, Marcus O'Dea, notes that a line about disappointment haunting his dreams had a very different resonance when delivered from a wheelchair. Wyatt's three minutes on the show have since taken on, taken on an enduring other life as a key popular cultural moment when the official media in Britain effectively sought to censor the work of a disabled artist. Violinist and guitarist Fred Frith recalled that the BBC wanted to cover the wheelchair completely because they thought it was in bad taste or might upset the viewers. Wyatt's memory zoned in on an argument with the producer. There was this producer saying, could you sit on something else? Wheelchairs just don't look well on a family entertainment show. He continued, I just exploded. The whole atmosphere frightened me. I just thought I was losing control of my life. The BBC here displaying its, its policy uncertainty around disability and entertainment, especially in the context of its feel-good, family-oriented popular music scheduling. The corporation's effect seemed to be an acceptable pop product being made by a public service media organisation for the tastefully able-bodied. At the height of his success through the 1970s, African-American soul singer Teddy Pendergrass had been first lead singer with Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes and then a solo artist whose debut album in 1977 went platinum. One of his performative strategies was his women-only concerts, at which he presented a powerful black masculine heterosexuality for female audiences, singing in a characteristically deep voice a repertoire of late-night seductive and romantic soul music. In a car accident in 1982, age 31, Pendergrass suffered a serious spinal cord injury, resulting in paraplegia. As a pop star, he had to negotiate the consequences of his changed life condition and corporeal capacity in public. As he said in his autobiography, while other patients went through their daily routines and had their bad moments under the shade of anonymity, I could not hide from being Teddy Pendergrass, the entertainer. One particularly insensitive article of music journalism some months after his accident both pierced and provoked him. Entitled, Vacancy, 
in search of the new Pendergrass. It informed readers that Teddy Pendergrass was the cool macho man with just a hint of sensitivity, exuding a kind of animal sexuality that seemed to turn on many females. Since the late 70s, he has been the number one black male singer sex symbol. According to his doctors, he will probably be able to sing, but it's unlikely that he'll ever walk again, which means that he probably won't perform. If he sang from a wheelchair, it wouldn't be the same. Pendergrass remembers how his spirit collapsed on reading those words. If I sang from a wheelchair, it wouldn't be the same. What the hell did that mean? I was stunned, enraged, hurt, devastated. How diminished worthless and inhuman those words made me feel. His manager had an idea. In 1985, Bob Geldof's Live Aid was happening in two arenas, one in London and the other in Philadelphia, Pendergrass's hometown. He could get Teddy a slot on the bill for his comeback gig. Yes, in front of 90,000 people in the arena and broadcast live around the world to a multi-million global audience. Let's see a little bit of that. We have a very special treat for you today. Tell the guy for the camera. Someone very special to us. And someone we love very much. It's gonna make its first appearance in a long time on a live stage. So I want you to put your hands together and give a big round of applause to Mr. Teddy Pendergrass. The band vamps for a short time while Pendergrass composes his tell, himself after the audience in the arena has seen him wipe away a tear. When he says to the audience, I want you to know, I feel your love. It sounds not like a vapid, crowd-pleasing showbiz statement, but a heartfelt recognition of support and validation. Pop helping its own. I am moving towards my final remarks. Petra Kuppers, disability studies and performance scholar, has written of the search for a cultural medium appropriate to breaking through the narratives of bodies and time. I'm suggesting that we think about popular music as such a medium. It deserves inclusion in the debate. According to Henri Jacques Dicaire in his fiendishly difficult and therefore tremendously rich book, a history of disability, don't be deceived by the simple title. People cannot stand difference. One likes only one's like. But popular music challenges this. Pop, crips, it really can. I want to return to where I began, to Ian Dury, that floor of the jungle. It was, after all, him who got me started on all of this 40 years ago. Um, at this gig, actually, in 1977. Was anyone else here there? 
Oh, my mum was there. <laughs> and she's here tonight. On International Women's Day. And two days after Mother's Day. Thank you, Mum. Um, not a bad bill for the UEA. I was a 16-year-old punk rocker with a weird way of walking and, so I was frequently told, an attitude problem? No. On a youthful research trip to my local university, I did a lot of research about music, the body and politics that year. It remains part of my cultural autopathography. The final gig I went to in 1977, six weeks later, good scene, was this one. Very rich research material that night too. A notorious singer, hunchbacked and staring the result, the result of childhood meningitis. Epileptic, singing songs with titles like Bodies. Sid actually asked me for a fight. <laughs> Vicious, not Charisse. Punk rock as a form or scene has spoken to people with disabilities and been able to do so across several generations of fans and musicians now in its various afterlives. Both punk's aesthetic of anger, as influential anarcho-punk band Crass put it, and its accessibility have been useful in the disability movement's cultural repertoire of contention and timely for the new kinds of disability radicals coming along who wanted a street confrontation in which the stark punkish slogan, piss on pity, was a key communication. Punk's archetypal DIY, do-it-yourself formula, this is a chord, this is another, this is a third. Now form a band. Now form a band. Thank you. Called out to and open space for the new marginal musical competence and incompetence alike. If you could not play an instrument or sing in tune or time, for whatever reason, here at last was a music scene that might be for you. Jury, one of Punk's stars, wrote increasingly about disability in his songs, most notably, of course, in his 1981 protest song, Spasticus Autisticus, to mark the UN, the United Nations International Year of Disabled Persons in 1981, Dewey had the idea of getting a band together who were either recruited from mental hospitals or recruited from really savagely disabled places. That being a little bit impractical, instead, he explained, he wrote a war cry and released it as a single. Spasticus Autisticus, he explains the genesis. The year of our disabled Lord, 1981, I was getting lots of requests. I turned them all down. We had this thing called the polio folio and we used to put them in there. Instead, I wrote this tune called Spasticus Autisticus. I said, I'm going to put a band together down the road for the year of the disabled. I'll be spastic and they can be the autistics. I have my band name, the Blockheads, and that means they're autistic anyway. And my mate goes, no, Spasticus Autisticus, the freed slave. Great, I'm Spartacus. So I wrote this tune. It wasn't allowed to be played anywhere, and people got offended by it. Everybody, except the spastics. Of course, in fact, spasticus was also a cultural effort at what Brendan Gleeson has termed the reappropriation and revalorization by disabled people of abject terms for impairment. What became of spasticus? Of spasticus activistus? A tremendously powerful musical moment took place in 2012 at the internationally televised opening ceremony for the Paralympic Games in London. It was co-directed by Grey Eye Theatre Company, uh, the leading company in Britain for deaf and disabled artists, by Grey Eye's Jenny Seeley, and culminated in a celebration of Brit Crip that included a live band, the Grey Eye Punk Band, reprising a song from their recent jukebox musical of Dury's work, Reasons to be Cheerful, to the accompaniment of protesters bearing placards with slogans like rights and look beyond appearances, and hundreds of disabled and deaf volunteer dancers, many in wheelchairs, 
the anti-aesthetic of punk suddenly burst out visually and sonically. Karen Zylance noted dryly the eruptive potential of incongruity. While the performance of national and even cosmic origin stories, she writes, is generic to opening and closing ceremonies in the games, protest is not. Taking action in the square or the street against authority generally runs counter to state celebration. And um, what was that noise? I mean, music. On a plinth was a punk rock band. And for two marvellous minutes, the world was Ian Juries, who had died a dozen years earlier. Hello to you out there in normal land, sang wheelchair singer John Kelly in his best, worst, cockney, malcanto voice, taking Juries' place to sing for a televised global audience his protest song, Spasticus Autisticus, that had, yes, originally been banned by the BBC and widely criticised by concerned disability charities. Huge screens in the crowds flashed up spasticus and autisticus during the repeated shouted chorus. And while the audience in the stadium cheered noisily, viewers in their homes sat up and paid attention. We did in my house. TAB, temporally able-bodied. TAB, as well as disability media comments, quickly confirmed that an extraordinary punk moment had taken place 30 years on. In a major media moment such as this televised opening ceremony, popular music history and the importance of the culture for disability were placed centre stage and screen. Who's up and puffed the wind out like giving me happy looks? You can do my buddy, but you never read my books. Oh, I'm Spasticus! 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 Autisticus! I'm Spasticus! 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 Autisticus! Oh, I'm Spasticus! 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 Autisticus! I'm all on the trouble tonight! I'm all in the trouble! Swear! Get up! Get up! Get up! Get down! Pull out the... That Spasticus is followed by the most famous disabled voice in the English-speaking world, the retro-synthesized tone of Professor Stephen Hawking accompanied by the techno, the EDM of Orbital, adds something further. Transform our perception of the universe. The professor insists that new lead singer on stage with a duo in his wheelchair all three of them wearing pairs of those cool orbital headlights in the dark. Shining lights, technologized voice, electronic music to help us, to tell us, to transform our perception. Transform our perception. Transform our perception of the universe. And then he repeats that. Transform our perception. Transform our perception. Transform our perception of the universe. Thank you.